Good morning. The scripture reading has changed a little bit this morning. We're going to back up a little bit to 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting with verse 16. Give you a minute to find that. <laughs> okay. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have longed for his appearing." Thanks, Nana. Let's just pray. Our Father in heaven, as we come to you and as we spend time looking into your word and considering our future as a church, we pray may your spirit be present in a very special way to enlighten and enliven your word to our hearts and minds. May we take from you what you want us to take from this passage of scripture and from the things that we share together now. So may you be glorified. We tr trust in you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, hopefully the live feed is working. We've had to get rid of the other camera. It's not working. something wrong. So uh, hopefully, John, you're watching and uh, hi to you and everyone else that, or any, anyone else that's watching. I uh, want to say, first of all, uh, we're looking at the, the topic today of uh, 2020, 2020 vision. Next year is 2020. And um, so, um, but first I want to just say, although next Sunday is our final Sunday, we are very blessed and grateful for um, the church and for the opportunity we've had over the last five or so years to work and serve the Lord with you. And we've seen, it's been a real joy uh, serving in this church and uh, we've built some very strong and lasting relationships and friendships that um, we don't want to lose. So we'll be maintaining uh, our uh, connections with you guys. As I reflected over the, um, the last couple of months to do with our time here in, uh, for over the five years, uh, we saw it, by the way, not as a job. It, it was a call. God obviously and very clearly called us here. Uh, there were so many factors in our coming that showed it was a God thing. So it was not a job. It was a call. And we came here to serve him and to please him in the time that we had with you guys. Uh, and as I reflected over that, I thought, well, you know, I had great and grandiose ideas but to see this church really grow and 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 um, you know big families coming in and the whole thing and it hasn't worked out that way that's humanly speaking but at the same time i then realized that when i was commissioned or we were commissioned from our home church in melbourne uh, they commissioned with the very passage that we read this morning the passage that says that you as a pastor like timothy are called are uh, actually charged to preach the word. Um, I've seen that that really has been the primary purpose in God sending us here, I believe, to preach and lay foundations for the future of this church and for every individual in it. So that's why we had that passage. And I'm going to, in 
incorporate within the message today about our vision for the future, uh, drilling down into that passage, and so I, I make no apologies for that, uh, because it's very much to do with the future of this church. My uh, verse that I want to kick off with, that is a, a primary verse that came to my heart and mind as I prepared, is the verse in Haggai chapter 1 verse 8, where God charged Zerubbabel um, to build my house, God says, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured. Build my house, God said, build my, my house, <clears throat> that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured. You know, I thought that's exactly what we're about. Building God's house, not so that we can take pleasure in it, not so that the world out there can take pleasure in it, but that he may take pleasure in it and that he may be honoured. Not me, not anyone in this congregation be honoured, but he will be honoured in what happens as we build the church. As he said, Jesus said, I will build my church. So if there's any building, it involves us with the giftings that he has given us by his grace. What have we that we've not received? Um, our personalities, everything about us, anything that we might put into the building of the church is all ultimately him. And he will build his church and he uses people to do that, that he may take pleasure in it, that he may be honoured. That should be our vision for the future. That should be the vision. To please him, whatever we do in the building of this church, and to honour him. He is to be glorified. He is to be central. He is the one whose church it belongs to. It's his church. Our responsibility is God's desire to build the church, but it's our responsibility to be a part of that. And so, how can we build this church in a way that will bring him pleasure and that will uh, bring him honour and glory? First of all, I'm going to look at there are absolutes that are essential to pleasing God and honouring God. And then we're going to look at more practical ways that we can look at building the church that also uh, will please God and honour God. So first of all, there has to be the absolutes. The whole point of church is that it's his and that we are called to honour him and follow his direction in the building of the church. There are truth absolutes. The biblical teaching of God's word is an absolute priority. That's the whole point of us coming together. That's the whole point. We are here to worship and we're here to learn. We're here to be challenged by God's word, to be rebuked if necessary and corrected and trained in righteousness that all that God wants to happen in our lives is centered in his word and his word applied to our lives. So, so Paul writes to Timothy, this young uh, pastor in the church at Ephesus, and he says to him, preach the word. Um, the major emphasis through all the New Testament epistles is to teach the truth and refute that which is false. The church is the bulwark of the truth. It's the, it's the uh, um, uh, I suppose, it's, it, it, it's a protective fortress of the truth. Nothing else in this world and no one else is. The church is the fortress that protects the truth from outside interference and deceit and... Uh, leading people astray, and it's our responsibility to maintain that. So uh, Dr. Toussaint, who is one of the lecturers and uh, professors down at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, came to New Zealand and Australia a couple of times, and, and I remember him saying about uh, the truth being um, uh, compared with counterfeit and, and falsehood. And he, he likened it to money, and he says if you've got a $100 bill... Um, 
and you see, you see a fake, how would you know if, it, if there's a counterfeit or a fake if you don't know the real thing? You, you can't, if somebody gave you a hundred dollar bill, which was a counterfeit, and you had never really studied the genuine thing, you would never be able to tell the false one. You have to know the truth in order to detect falsehood. And the more we know God's word daily in our own quiet times and time with God and in our weekly exposure to the word of God, whether it's been a Bible study, Sunday school or in the expository preaching and teaching of the word of God in a church service, that enables us to then detect when somebody teaches something, you read a book or you see something on YouTube or whatever, and you say, that doesn't jive with what I know God's word says. Because you know God's word. And the importance of Paul's charge to Timothy is this. I charge you to preach the word. That, as a pastor, is your priority. That is totally above everything else. Caring for the needy, yeah, everyone can do that. And it's my responsibility and your responsibility, all of us, to do that. And to stand up for justice and, and good things and so on in this world and, and, to, and to do all the stuff, the organising and the planning and the, uh, the potlucks and everything else. It's, it's all part of church life, but the priority is to preach the word and to worship our Lord. Amen. I want to drill down into this a little bit more. It's an imperative. It's a command to Timothy. Preach the word. The word preach means to herald. It's the same thing. It's the word that's used of a, of a king who sends out uh, someone as his herald or a queen who sends out her herald to, to preach or to teach or to, to say the message that the king wants everyone to hear, understand and obey. So that herald has no right to change what the king says, to add to it or to take away from it or to change it in any way. And we have no right. I've said things from this pulpit that people have not liked. Well, it's not me, it's him, it's the word. You cannot cannot change God's word. It stands forever. And what it says about all sorts of subjects that are controversial today is unchangeable. And we have to conform to the word, not make the word conform to us. And that's what Peter says will happen in the last days, that people will, will um, twist scripture like they do uh, back then to make it form what they want it to say. No. Preach, herald the word. J.I. Packer, a great author, says, we, should we shall never perform a more important task than preaching. Biblical preaching is the pastor's primary task. Not only preach, but preach the word. This is the divine nature. In fact, talk about, I've said it before in this, in this letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, uh, there's unfortunate um, breaks in the chapters. So that's been arbitrarily put on by someone in the 16th century and uh, back in the original manuscript, there's no chapter break and that's why I had uh, Nina to start reading in verse 16 of the previous chapter because it's all in one flow. It says, all scripture is God breathed. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable for teaching. Then he goes on to say in verse 1 of, verse, of chapter 4, in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, I charge you, preach the word. The, the divine, empowered and, and inspired word of God is what is to be preached. So that's the imperative. There's an implication here. He says, if you're going to preach it, this is what's going to happen. You're going to correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. 
So he says, first of all, correct. That is to expose falsehood, to convince somebody that they're wrong in what they believe or that they're guilty in what they've done. That's not very nice to do. I come up to you and say, you're wrong. Here's what the Bible says. I've had to do that. I've had people in my office here and in previous churches who believe something to be totally, not just something minor, something major, who, who treat Jesus like he was just another great prophet and teacher, but nothing more than that. Hey, you have to correct. Hey, I'm sorry, but the word of God says this and, and give reasons why you believe what the Bible teaches. And not only that, but convince people of wrong to show them from Scripture that their lifestyle or whatever is wrong. That's our responsibility. That's my responsibility, especially as a pastor. To rebuke is the second word. That's to disapprove or condemn. We don't like to condemn. We don't like to hear people condemn. It's so foreign to the PC world we live in. You believe that and I believe that. You, you live that way and I live this way. But in God's word and in the church of Jesus Christ, the call for the pastor is to rebuke. Whew. What kind of pastor are you looking for? You need to have someone who will teach the word, who's not afraid to correct and rebuke. Lovingly, sure, Jesus was full of grace and truth. Not just grace, not just truth. Grace and truth, the beautiful combination of love, mercy, kindness and compassion linked with the uncompromising stand on truth. I want to hear an amen. amen. The, uh, he goes on to say, to encourage so it's not all negative. He says, I want you to come alongside. That's the idea of the word, para. It's to come alongside, to encourage, to strengthen, to help someone make their pathway in life and, and do the right thing and to, to follow Jesus, truly follow Jesus. And then he says, be prepared in season and out of season, no matter what the situation, uh, you will be speaking when people will not want to hear what you have to say. He says, that's out of season, but don't stop preaching the word. And in season when everyone's there and listening. And then he says, with great patience, because it's not easy. There's going to be people who will just not listen to you or, 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 or refuse to take it in. Or for other reasons, you'll need great patience. But he goes on to say, and careful instruction. Notice he talks about preaching the word, then he talks about sound doctrine in verse 3 and truth in verse 4. So it's all tied together, the word of God. Then he says, but there's going to be people who have itching ears. You ever had an itch that you really, you know, sometimes at night I'm just about to sleep and I've got this itch in the middle of my back and I know that if I scratch it, I'm going to half wake up and in fact, it's going to, you know, so I've got to reach, reach around and scratch that itch. But it, yeah, sometimes I think, well, I'll just pretend it's not there. I'll just go to sleep, but it's still there. And you just have to scratch it. Itching is, there's a strong urge, right? And these people have a strong urge to hear what they want to hear. That lines up with their own personal beliefs, their own personal lifestyle and standard of righteousness. Itching ears. And so they'll be attracted. They'll go to churches or they'll, they'll listen online or whatever to those that support their view, even though it's contrary to the plain teaching of God's word. And Paul says, don't avoid teaching the truth, even though there's going to be people with itching ears seeking teachers who will do and say what they want to hear. People have left every church I have pastored 
because of this issue. And I, I am upset every time. I really deeply, it hurts. You ask Marg. But at the same time, I'm not pleasing me. I'm pleasing him. And if I was teaching falsehood, then I wouldn't be pleasing him. But if it's plain, clear in the scripture, there's no answer except preach the truth, preach the word. All right, and then the importance of it, uh, and then I'll stop drilling down, okay? So we're about through this part of it. The importance of it is this. He says, I give you this charge. Hey, wait a minute. He adds that. The word in the Greek is solemn charge, and some translations translate it that way. So it's not just a charge, it's a solemn charge, but he goes on more than that. So that, that would be enough for me. But Timothy, he says, in the presence of God, I give you this solemn charge. Ah, there's more. He says, in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, I give you this solemn charge. And then he goes on and says more. He says, who will judge the living and the dead? You're going to stand before the, the great uh, the, 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 the beamer, the, the judgment seat of Christ, where all believers will stand and be judged at what they've done, it says in 1 Corinthians, in their body, what they've done during life. Who is, judge, who is the judge of the living and the dead in view of his appearing in his kingdom? Uh, it's all going to be over soon. You're going to be standing before him and what you've said and what you've done and how the congregation has responded individually to the word of God is all part of this. That's why it's a solemn charge. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead and his kingdom and his coming and his appearance. I solemnly charge you, preach the word. Could it be more emphatic, more emphasized than that? Then he ends up by saying, fulfill your ministry. Right, let's move on. Not only is it truth absolutes that are part of the uh, absolutes that are essential to pleasing God and honouring God, but there's uh, what I would call righteousness absolutes. There's moral purity, the importance of um, protecting the church from accepting sin and the sinner... What I mean is, accepting the sin as well as the sinner. You accept the sinner. We always accept the sinner. Well, I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. And we're accepted. And there's people... Who has not sinned this week? Put up your hand. Oh, my hand's up just for illustration. <laughs> we're all sinners. And some sin more overtly and blatantly than others. And we're all saved by God's grace. And some of us believe a certain lifestyle is okay and others don't. And whatever God says about the sin is separate from our acceptance of everybody who comes into this place and sits in a pew and, and wants to um, worship God. You're welcome. But the sin can never be discounted. It can never be uh, little, uh, made little of and, 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 and uh, regarded as not important. So we have righteousness. Uh, the, the God's moral standards never change. We need to maintain... A culture where people, whoever they are, no matter what their lifestyle, are lovingly accepted and treated with respect, but never compromise on God's revealed standard of right and wrong. Never. It's his church. It's to please him, not us. And to honour him, not us. Then there's love absolutes. We are called to love. In the church, we're to maintain unity and diversity, despite the diversity. There's huge diversity in this church, and in every church there's diversity. 
but there needs to be love that maintains the unity despite that diversity. And that's a command. It's, what, it's incumbent upon us as God's people to, to love. Uh, and love for the lost. Our mandate is to take the gospel uh, in evangelism and share uh, with those who are, who are not uh, saved, those who, who are lost, and go into a lost eternity. It's so sad when someone dies. My niece, I'm sorry, my um, uh, cousin in Australia, her husband died just last the other, a couple of days ago. And I don't believe he's a believer. And that's sad. It's so sad. We grieve talking of Christians but not like those who have no hope. We love, and so we we love the lost. Our mission, somebody has written about Christians having a missional fog, uh, meaning that their minds um, think that mission for the church is helping the needy and doing welfare outreach and stuff like that, sociological stuff. And we're to do that. We're to love our neighbour as ourselves. We're, of course we're to love them. But our mission, our mandate is to take the gospel into all the world and make disciples of Jesus. That's the mission. And it includes loving and helping those in need. But our primary responsibility, even in this passage, Paul says to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Take the gospel. Share the gospel. When did you, when did I last share the gospel with someone and seek to win a person for Jesus Christ? Love absolutes move us to build his house so that he may take pleasure in it and be honoured. And then there's reliance absolute. That's the way I put it, but it really means to pray. We are called to pray. That's our responsibility, a priority. How much of it is a, of a priority is it in your life? We have church prayer meetings. You know, the, the church, our home church, when we were pastoring there, we, we had a prayer meeting and, and half the church turned up for our monthly prayer meeting. They were really, mo- and no wonder God blessed. It's God's work. And if we don't trust him and let him do the work by our trust in him, he gets the glory when we pray and when he answers prayer, then he is honoured and he is pleased. But we just do it. We don't really think about prayers being all that important. Oh yeah, we pray. Hey, then God is not honoured because if anything happens, well, well, it's us doing it. Prayer is saying, God, we are helpless unless you build this house We labor in vain. Oh, God, send us the right pastor to to take the next chapter and lead in the next chapter of our church's life. Lord, we, 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 we just need you to do that. We need you to bring families to us, to guide us in decisions we make in the, in the uh, leadership uh, of the different uh, boards and so on. We need you, Lord, unless you build this house. We're going to labor in vain. Oh, that, that, that prayer would become more of a priority in the life of this church. That's the vision for the future. All of these things, all these absolute priorities come first. Then we look at the practical. Well, let's look at the practical. I've got to say, first of all, there's a slide up there, I think that says the church has to decide what kind of church it is in order to get the right pastor and to make the right, uh, take the right direction as we move forward. What kind of church are we? Are we just a Quaker church? Or are we an evangelical in the right sense, the word, that word is so badly used at times because of extremists. But evangelical mean, comes from evangel, means to preach the gospel. 
Are we a gospel-preaching, gospel-believing, Bible-based church? That's what we should be. That's why I came here, because I believed you were. Are we a church that remains faithful to God's word in belief and practice, and we, or are we moving towards becoming a more liberal church? Liberalism is sweeping this nation. And many churches, unfortunately, are getting caught up in it. People looking for a church that teaches the word of God and go from church to church till they find one because often it's not happening. Lots of stories and illustrations and stuff like that, but not teaching the word. We need to take seriously what God says. Build my house that I may take pleasure in it and be on it. So what are the practical areas? Well, uh, strategic planning is what we're talking about. Here's pragmatic ideas. Uh, these are things that, that um, may or may not work and... and, and well, pragma pragmatism is dealing with things realistically based on practical considerations. So uh, we've looked at the, the uh, unchangeable absolutes. Now we're looking at some of the areas where we really need to think pragmatically. If this church is going to really have a vision for the future and really grow and know God's blessing, uh, get all the absolutes right, then we start looking at the practical area. And so uh, Carmel Friends Church needs to adapt without compromise to the culture, to the local demographics and to our own limitations in resources and personnel and uh, move forward knowing that our church congregation is ageing and uh, how old will you be in 10 years? How old will you be in 20 years? How many of the older ones are doing so much in the church? And we need to see that as for the future of the church. Uh, there's a need for some of the older ones to step... They know, they've said, to step aside. And we, it's totally understandable because they're, they're at an age now where they, they can't keep on doing what they've been doing. Totally understandable. But we've got to face that realistically as a church. How do we move forward? We have to build in the younger uh, demographic. Uh, there, was a there is a church in, um, I think, in, in Florida where there's lots of retired people. Um, and it, they changed their mission statement. So we are a church for retired people. Great. Well, if that's their mission statement, that's their mission... And they'll probably do very well. But is that what we want? I don't think so. Only one person shook their head, but I'm sure a few did inside without actually physically doing it. We need to, first of all, gear for a younger demographic. And I'm going to say some practical things here. First of all, children's ministry. Oh, it's so hard to get it to a point where that children's ministry is a, um, I suppose, a, uh, a functioning core that is uh, secure. We're still working on that. And our messy church is part of that whole strategy to try and build up the younger families. And it's not easy when you're starting from scratch. It's not easy at all. Do you know what? I believe, and this is part of my practical suggestions for the church, that you employ a part-time person as a children's pastor for two days a week and invest in that. Maybe if the church doesn't have the budget, there may be individuals in the church who will say, yeah, I'll give above my normal giving to the church to, in, to actually empower somebody and pay somebody for two days a week to actually really work at building up the children's ministry, the young family's ministry who can visit homes and can do all that kind of stuff and, and work with the kids. It was just Our last church, not our home church, but our last church was five years at 
at Edge Church in Melbourne. And when we went there, they just had a pastor who got messed up morally and had to be booted out and, and, and the church fell apart, people left and all that. So we ended up with eight, eight children in our children's ministry. And we saw this as a real need. So what we did was we worked out a budget, told people, asked people, just like I'm saying here, to give extra. So we, and we employed a, a, a young woman for two days a week and her husband played the guitar, so that was a bonus. And he was part of the music team, the worship team. But, um, and she came in and, and, and it grew and it grew. And now there's 60, 80 kids there. And the church is just booming. Because there was a, there was a need and they were willing to actually put money to that need and build that area of the, the church life. We need that, I believe. That's my own personal view. We have wonderful musicians, but it'd be great to have a guitarist, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe we could find somebody. In, there's plenty of churches around here with so many musicians, they can't use them all. Maybe advertise and say, would someone like to come one, uh, go to a different service at your home church, but come here and, and we'll, we'll give you gas money or something and come and play guitar to help us... Uh, to, to become more um, appropriate for reaching the younger demographic. And we have good songs and everything, uh, but ultimately, probably, the best way is to have two services, but we can't do that. We don't have enough people. We have one service that's more traditional and one that's more contemporary. And that's what we did in both the last churches we were at, and it worked really well, but we had enough people to do that. But as it grows, that's something that needs to be looked at so that the younger demographic feel a lot more comfortable. Uh, music's so huge in the minds of younger ones. Absolutely right up there. They come into a church, that is one of the things that they factor into their decision whether they'll come again. So I'm saying this, this, is, this is stuff that is, is um, uh, what would say, uh, pragmatic. It's, 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 um, can be taken or left, or, but but it's something I'm throwing out there. The next thing is to break with the past. Respect the church's heritage as a friend's church, but don't let that become a shackle uh, for the church for the future. I think that's so important. That people come to this church and it's, and it's like some pounce on them and try and convert them into becoming Quakers. So it's happened, believe me. And I shudder. What other church do you go to? A Baptist church, and I, hey, you're going to become a Baptist, and I'll tell you all about being a Baptist. Or a, a Church of Christ, or an Anglican, or well, Anglican, he was an uh, Episcopalian. You don't have that happen. Somebody said when we started Messy Church, oh, that's great, we can introduce them to being a Quaker. I want to introduce them to Christ. I'm sorry, but that can be a shackle in this church. We've got to be first a church of Jesus Christ that honours his word and loves him and secondly a Quaker church. Yes, respect the truth that it is a Quaker church but that is not the primary thing of what we are. Same with every church. And I say the same thing to my own denomination back in Australia. I've said exactly those words because the churches, the community churches of Australia um, um, we have people there who have the same mindset. So I'm moving slowly, but I'm getting there. The next one is leadership. The church needs to be going somewhere and seem to be doing it. You have people uh, come to a church, they judge a church. And by the way, where do, the church will grow from people who are brought to faith in Christ and through Christians who in the area are looking for a church or move into the area. And looking at the ones who are Christians who come to the area or look for a church, if they come to a church and they think it's going nowhere, they won't want to be a part of that. But when they see a church that is moving, doing things and wanting to reach out, and that says so much, it speaks volumes to people looking for a church. Especially ones who might likely get involved. 
Do you really want to grow? Because there's dying pains and there's growing pains. I'd rather be in a church which has growing pains. There's going to be pains when you grow because you have to adapt. And that leads me to my next point. I believe we need to upgrade the facilities. This next slide will show you the sanctuary as you see it right now. And the photo on the left is the slide of looking from the wall there across to that wall there. Okay? Most churches, somebody said to me just recently, does your church still have pews? I said, yes. Oh. Um, because, and I, I, I realised that, churches that are really um, contemporary churches have gotten rid of the pews and made it much more homely and, 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 and much more um, uh, community-wise than a theatre style. And so my suggestion is that we get rid of the pews. Let's see the next slide. And that's a, that's a photo I've taken from there, but I've, I've, I've put in those, I've uh, mixed a couple of pictures together from uh, the internet. And made, so that is the actual wall over there at the back of that picture at the top. And I've put in the rest uh, just sort of editing the pictures so that you can get a vision of what it would like if people came in and, and the piano and everything was over there and people sat in a semicircle on on seats like that, that would say a lot to a person coming in. And if we got rid of the wall between the parlour and the the um, the uh, foyer, or made holes in it, and had tables out there, and, and 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 sort of like a cafe kind of thing, and 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 made brighter uh, new carpet, of course, but brighter. Um, uh, foyer uh, it, it, with something like this it would say so much now that might be in the five, ten year plan but it might be in next year's plan who knows have a fundraiser we're going to fundraise to get someone to haul away these pews no one will want to buy them so you just have to haul them away and put in some seats that's my suggestion. And don't call it a sanctuary. Call it a worship centre. Or I'll say it your way. Worship centre. <laughs> All right. We're on the last slide. And there's a question or there's a statement there. One thing that you think should change in the church. I want you to think about that real quick now. What's one thing you think should change? There's many things perhaps, but what's one thing? Anything. You might say the pastor. Yeah, well, that's going to happen, so don't worry. <laughs> One or two words, and I'm going to get you to call them out. But everyone has to do it. So if you're not you're used to calling out in church, we'll give you a trial. First of all, I want you to call out, let's say, a word. Um, my, I call my wife Kuchi. So everyone call out Kuchi. No, louder. Okay, now I want you to call out loud, all together, what you think needs to be changed in the church. Ready, set, go. Again, loud. Oh, this didn't work. I, I, I didn't give you enough time to think about it. Just think of something crazy, if you like. Now, everybody, say now. The front door in the worship room is all I heard. Okay, this isn't going to work, but I think you'll get the message when you look at the next question. Who's the one person who should be exalted and, 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 and central in this church? Altogether, one, two? Jesus. So we may differ on the changes that we think might are the first things that need to happen in the church. We may all call out different things, but when it comes to the central 
reason we're here and the central person we worship and honor, it's Jesus. And so the last song we sing is Jesus be the center. And may that be real and true in the life of this church, in choosing a pastor, in um, making decisions that will impact and changes that will affect some and they won't like it or will like it or whatever. Jesus be the center. Amen? Amen. Let's sing it. <laughs>